All right. I'm sure some other people will probably be dropping in as this goes on, but out of respect for your time and our guest, uh, our guest speaker, I want to go ahead and get started. Um, I'd like to introduce Zach Bowders to you all. For anyone who's not familiar with his work, he is the founder and um, I don't know, what do you call yourself? The podcaster? Uh, the Data Plus Love podcast is his baby, and um, if you haven't subscribed to it, it's on Spotify and a number of other podcast uh, platforms. I always use Spotify, so that's my go-to. Um, so if you haven't listened to it before, I highly recommend you do because he um, spends time interviewing other data fam one-on-one -on -one and just finding out not only their their viz style and preferences, but just interesting tidbits about them that you may not know. Um, Zach, if you want to say a few things about yourself, I know that you had mentioned you wanted to make a brief announcement before your presentation. Sure. I, I work at Joan Lang's La, Jones Lang LaSalle out of Chicago, JLL, and we are actually hiring right now for senior analysts and specialists. Specialist is the more senior of the two titles, but if you're interested in that, I'm going to drop my uh, Twitter handle at the end of this. Um, and I'd love to tell you more if you're interested. If you're happy what you're doing, um, don't sweat it. But yeah, these positions are all virtual. So if you're in the US and you don't need sponsorship to work, um, it's a great uh, company. And I've been there about seven months now myself. Um, but yeah, with that, let me go ahead and fire up my presentation. So hi, I'm here to talk to you today about thinking differently. Um, Steve Jobs sort of coined the, not coined the expression, but made famous the expression think different in the late 90s when he was returning to Apple and sort of making a pitch for what if your computer could be something different than what it is now. And I sort of embraced that idea. And uh, I'm going to take it to some hopefully some interesting places. This is about the third time I've done this uh, presentation. You are the smallest tug I've presented to. Having said that, my home tug is also very small. I am uh, one of the co-leads of the Memphis tug, which has been defunct for about a year. We haven't met virtually because we're also so new, but on average, we had about 15 to 20 members. Um, having said that, the smallest tug overall is the Big Sky tug in Montana, which only has Kate Schaub. So you're doing a lot better than them. So keep up the good work. So I'm Zach Bowders. Like I said, I'm a BI specialist at JLL. And uh, sorry, that's a picture of my six-year-old. Let me pick some. Okay, there. I'm Zach Bowders. Um, I am a Tableau ambassador and more recently a Tableau Zen master. Uh, what that means is the ambassador aspect is uh, Tableau uh, likes to sort of pick out people that are really active in the community and do a good job of supporting others and sort of, you know, promoting the platform, but also promoting uh, enthusiasm for analytics. And the Zen master just means I've been pretty prolific and uh, they recognized me for a lot of the work I've done. But um, I'm also a two-time Vizzy Award winner from the Tableau Conference for Must Run on Coffee or Coke, which means I spend way too much time making analytics and greatest growth, which means I wasn't so good the year before and then I got a little bit better. Um, as Jenny said, I am the host of the Data Plus Love podcast, which is the sort of a voice behind the data story. So when you see all those cool visas that people are putting online um, and a lot of them coming from, you know, people that might sort of be big names or newcomers, um, I like to get to know both kinds of folks and sort of talk to them about what their influences are, how they come to their ideas and what their method is. And uh, Jenny's been on the podcast herself. I am the Memphis Tug co-lead and I'd like to be a data artist. Uh, I guess I am just not getting paid for it. So a uh, starving artist there, but I want to talk to you and uh, I swear this ties into data, so bear with me, about dyslexia and dysgraphia, both of which my nine-year-old daughter has. So dyslexia, if we're going to think about this in terms of computing, dyslexia is garbage in, where uh, the brain is actually wired differently from a typical brain, and uh, the inputs received in get jumbled up. I remember early on working with my daughter in first grade, and she would uh, try to read, and it was a painful exercise for both of us. And going down a page, she could see the word when three different times. And when she looked at it, it looked like three different words. Dysgraphia is the garbage out. So the kid knows what they want to say. I say kid, could be an adult. About 20% of people have some form of dyslexia or dysgraphia. 
Um, but instead of stuff coming out the way they mean for it to, it comes out garbled. So it's the, uh, the other side of dyslexia where outputs are also scrambled. So my, uh, my daughter goes to something called the Bodine School in the United States. We only have about 15 schools for dyslexia and I'm fortunate enough to live within 20 minutes of one of those. Having said that, costs a small fortune, but it's been incredible. So she's actually graduating out of the school this year and going off to a private school. Public schools around here still aren't really equipped to handle dyslexia, but there are many private schools in the area that teach the Orton-Gillingham method, which is a method pioneered specifically to teach dyslexics how to read. It turns out dyslexics are just as capable of reading as everyone else. It's just you have to integrate reading into their lives and their brains differently than everyone else. So they're, they're just as capable, just not from the same teaching methods. So at the Bodine School, much in the Harry Potter model, they have different houses of famous dyslexics, Einstein, Da Vinci, Jobs, and Edison. And um, they have house points that the kids work to earn to sort of um, get them to do extra homework, try a little harder in class and that sort of thing. So this is an example of the house points that they used to compete. And uh, Henry Winkler, who's also a famous dyslexic. So there have been a lot of people that are dyslexics Octavia Spencer, Edison, Whoopi Goldberg, Spielberg, Disney, um, Orlando Bloom, so many people. Um, but as I see my daughter and how she doesn't interact with the world exactly the same way I do, um, or you know, my wife or anyone else that's sort of neurologically typical, I think about some of these famous dyslexics and how so many of them um, became pioneers of different fields like Walt Disney for just sort of looking at um, what was possible from a different angle. So many times um, we don't uh, turn a question on its head and look at it different ways. And uh, I wanted to talk to you today about three different techniques I like to use when I'm looking at data about how you could sort of approach it from a different angle. And all of these are sort of inspired from me thinking about how my daughter interacts with the world. So the first of these three is to reject convention. So if you're dyslexic, you're not going to be able to learn to read in the same way as everyone else. And that's not going to be just when you're learning to read, it's going to be for the rest of your life. So you're actually going to have to adapt and come up with different methods of getting the same stuff done as everyone else. So there are times when, uh, and obviously I'm only showing you passion projects, I can't go through work portfolios. Uh, there are times when you need to think about something in a different way than it might typically be presented. For example, what if you used pie charts in a different way rather than parts to a whole? This example here is an example of using a pie chart instead of representing parts to a whole to represent multiple aspects of an individual. So in this case, if you take Marvel Comics characters, you're able to show multiple team affiliations for a character. While not giving that one character an outsized space on the screen, you're able to show all the different parts that make up what they belong to. Alternatively, um, what if you were trying to show um, what it looks like for someone that is colorblind. So the temptation with so many chart types that we get, see whenever we get a number, we want to make it all about the number, right? So in this case, we've got 1.27% of men um, experience due to nephoria, which each of these represents uh, essentially different cones lacking in the eye. So it's um, your color perception is determined by sort of the level and deficiencies of cones. So I, we actually know someone in the Tableau community um, who is totally gray colorblind, totally gray scale. So uh, that, that came up strongly um, when talking about use of color and data visualization, when there was a throwback football game on TV where they sort of put the teams in classic uniforms, but because there was no badging on the uniforms and the, the two teams were red and green, literally both teams looked identical to him. He literally could not tell them apart. So in this case, discussing colorblindness by actually showing what colorblindness looks like. So rather than having that conversation with a coworker saying, hey, have you thought about how this might go over for someone that's colorblind, literally just showing what red and green looks like and then showing how that might look for someone else. Now, obviously we can't 100% experience colorblindness, but it might um, open your eyes a little bit to some of the, uh, the reasons to be more sensitive to it. Or what if you thought about um, the marketplace for video game sales and you chose an unorthodox chart type. There are definitely a lot of out of the box chart types that would explain this just as well. However, sometimes choosing the most conventional chart type might mean people don't look. Um, and I'm definitely not saying to use a stream graph 
at work. So it took me about 14 attempts to make this chart. Not this particular one, but about 14 attempts to get one to work, period. It's a highly technical chart type. There's about 14 to 15 layers of calculations you have to go through to make it happen. But the outcome of it can be pretty telling. So you can actually see the marketplace of video game cartridge or you know disc units sold and how they started off fairly small back in the 80s and then expanded as more companies entered the mix. So you can see in 1994, Sony enters into the mix with the PlayStation. And then in the late uh, 20s, you can see a boom and then contraction of the market, which is mostly told by the Nintendo Wii system, which came with a game, which is a practice that had been phased out long ago by most companies. But every single Nintendo Wii came with Wii Sports. When you bought it, your grandma bought it. Everyone's mom had a, had a Nintendo Wii in their house. And they all came with a copy of that game, which for you know, the year that that came out in particular caused a major boom in the market only for the market to contract again afterwards. But maybe telling the story in a different way might not have grabbed as many eyes. So sometimes trying something, swinging for the fences, doing something a little different, defying convention is a great way to get started. Another thing that uh, my daughter has to do is embrace ambiguity. So, um, I am used to reading. I've been doing it my entire life. It's always been easy. I read my first novel, like cover to cover in 24 hours when I was 11 years old. Um, didn't seem like a big deal. Having said that, for, for my child, it's a huge deal. It's incredibly challenging. Um, and it's also very uncertain. Like she, she has to do things in a different way and uh, sort of get comfortable being uncomfortable. So having said that, what would I do if I were trying to express time in a nonlinear fashion? So um, in the Back to the Future movie franchise, obviously Marty, McT Marty McFly and uh, the, the doc are moving back and forth through time, right? He starts in 1985, he goes back in 1955 and sees his parents, travels to the far flung future of 2015 where we're in flying cars and hoverboards, and then back to 1885 for the ill-fated third installment of the series in the Wild West with ZZ Top. But while Marty is traveling in time with a time machine, Marty is also traveling chronologically in his own personal timeline. So while geographically he might be in the past, Marty is older than he was five minutes earlier in the film. So this was a chart I was experimenting with to express time in two different directions simultaneously. And uh, I mean, it's definitely an unorthodox chart type. Having said that, I got a lot more criticism from people for the uh, vividly colored background, which I'll stand by because Marty wore an obnoxiously bright 80s vest. And uh, I think it works. But having said that, obviously, um, this is not a conventional chart type. But sometimes when you're dealing with data types that are uncertain or unusual or unorthodox, you might have to also get comfortable with the idea of making a chart that is not actually normal. This is an expression of a choose your own adventure book. So if you start at the top of the book and you move down, the further down the page represents how many decisions have been made by the reader. So the further you make it, obviously the longer the story has lasted. The further right you make it is the higher the page number. So. In the upper left-hand corner, everybody starts at page one. But as you proceed down the page, making more choices, and to the right, having made it further into the book, um, you reach different points in the story. So this particular Choose Your Own Adventure had 44 different endings. And if you think it was, uh, was challenging figuring out how to get to all those, it certainly was. So what I did instead of starting at the beginning and trying to find every variant is I flip the book around, start at the final pages of each, and then trace them back to the beginning, which was a good way to get to those endings. So both in terms of how this chart came about and then also how I got the data for the chart, I had to come up with a different way of doing it. Uh, lastly, for this section, um, my associate pastor was talking one morning and it was a good sermon. I swear I stand by that. And I tell him that, but in the middle of it, I thought, how does the movie inception work? I mean, I've seen it and I understood it at the time, but if you think about it, it's a series of nested dreams, like a Russian nesting doll. 
And each time they go to sleep, they're entering a one of their own team's dreams as they try to sort of orchestrate this dream heist. So on the back of my program in church, I found myself starting to uh, scroll this out. And I was pretty close. I had to rewatch it to get it right. But how would you map like a heist or a dream or something that actually has points that you have to progress through? That's not something where you're going to get a nice data set that's sort of numerically based. Uh, I've had to do something uh, at work recently where there were different stages something had to progress through. And I had to know what the average velocity is for the project, meaning the time from one stage to the next. One of the challenges of that was not every single um, item goes through every single stage. So having to sort of deal with the ambiguity that um, things are not always going to have the exact same number of stages between them. And how am I going to come up with a calculation that I'll calculate between this thing and that thing when I don't know how many things are supposed to be in between? So sometimes just sort of getting used to the idea, okay, I'm going to start from a place of uncertainty and I might have to do some, uh, some creative thinking in order to get to my answer. Because while I am someone that tells you, yeah, about 90% of the time bar charts are the right answer for your problem, sometimes they're not, and sometimes they're really not. Um, having said that, pie charts are almost never the right answer. So my third and final tip is to reiterate relentlessly, which uh, is definitely something you'll trip up on if you try to say that fast. So um, what I'm going to show you now is this is a data set based on US baby names uh, by year of birth. So I put this thing together kind of like a card. So if you actually go to this particular viz on my Tableau profile, you're able to type in something for the header. So happy birthday, happy anniversary, uh, what have you. And then you can select two names and male or female because many names have both male or, or female names. Like I have a friend named Michael who's female um, and I have friends named Michael who are male. Um, so this is based on sort of the US Census uh, birth data. And what you're able to do is by selecting those names, you're able to create these two overlapping area charts, which show both the overlap of those names and popularity, but also when those names peaked. So right here, you can see that Mary peaked in 1921 with about 74,000 Marys born that year. And Michael peaked in 1957 with about 93,000 born. So both those are very popular names. Um, but they peaked at different times and had different highs. Um, one thing in particular with this data set is it was interesting to find that um, there is much more of diversity in names of, of females than males, although that is uh, the gap is narrowing, and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. But this was sort of my first take of this data set. But much like if you're at work, unless you're a consultant just doing one particular task and then moving on, very rarely are you going to look at a data set just one time and be done. So I've made a habit of revisiting passion project data sets and seeing if I get another idea a second time. So I came back to this data set and the second time I thought, you know, in Mambo number five, Lou Vega sings about like a lot of women and how old were these girls exactly? Like there's a whole lot of different names, Angela, Pamela, Sandra, Rita. So I took that same data set and sort of applying these to a joy plot, which is what we call it when we have these area charts that overlap about how old might these women have been if they were born in the peak year for any of those particular names. I also put a disclaimer on here. So Lou Bega doesn't sue me about the fact that Jessica, had she been born in 1987, would have been 12 years old. But um, having said that, it's the same data set. It's a little bit of a different take. And it's actually even the same chart type. But it's a totally different tone. It's a totally different message. And it's exploring a different idea. So then I thought, you know, I'm probably done with this. I don't have any more ideas, but I proved to be wrong. So this actually scrolls down quite a bit. I'm not a big fan of scrolly telling visualization, which is where chart where charts are very high and you have to keep working your way down. But this one worked out particularly well. So in this case, for each generation of people born in the US, which I've color coded on area charts, as you scroll down, you'll get to see what the most popular male and female name was for that generation and what the counts were for that as as it sort of progressed. So while uh, Mary and John were the most popular names for men and women in the greatest generation, you know, you can sort of see their progression later. And in some cases, many of these names repeat, particularly men's names. If you looked at this particular data set, you'd find that sort of men's biblically based names like uh, John, Mark, Matthew, very high. 
Women's names started out strong with Mary, but very quickly diversified and are different almost every generation, which you can tell from the chart at the top with the uh, lines, both the purple and the green, you can see that both men's and women's names in terms of the distinct count throughout the generations has been increasing. And uh, while they both start out similarly, women have diversified much faster. Having said that, men are also diversifying, but uh, apparently we're much more creative with women's names than men's names, which I thought to be particularly interesting. Having said that, I wanna challenge you to think differently about uh, your, your projects, your passion projects, how you look at data, how you think about data. Try taking a different perspective on it, trying a different chart. Um, I mean, like I said, most of the time, a bar chart will do you just fine, but sometimes you're gonna stumble upon something that is going to not only maybe open up the corridors of understanding and ideation, but maybe inspire your audience to explore the data more, which is really what we'd want. So my Twitter handle is at Zach Bowders, and I'm gonna stick around if you guys would like to ask any questions. Um, but I would love to hear from you um, about the presentation or if you're interested in talking about JLL uh, or if you uh, say, hey, I'd like to listen to the podcast. I'd like a link, particularly to Jenny's episode because it's pretty cool. Um, I'd love to hear from you. But anyway, thanks for having me on today. Thank you so much, Zach. If anyone has questions for Zach, please um, put them in the Q&A or the chat box. If I could figure out how to let you all come off of mute and <laughs> ask <laughs> person, I would. Someone has a we and loves it. I got that much. That's me. <laughs> 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 I do, it's the only, um, it's the only console. But you know what? You're making my point for me. Yeah. The only console I own. Um, Rashid asks, what uh, was the Inception dashboard created in Tableau? Yes, 100%. So um, if I wanted to go back to that. Um, so this Rashid, is that correct? Okay. Mm -hmm. So much like this dashboard, this is using the same technique. So this is mapping Cartesian coordinates, which is basically just X's and Y's. So if you think about like a scatter plot in Tableau, you know, you've got your sort of L shape and then you've got dots placed throughout that. What's happening there is there's an X coordinate and a Y coordinate, usually based on sales or volume, something like that. And that's determining where things align in here. What I did instead was because there's no data set for how did the crime happen in, um, in Inception, what I did was I figured out the shapes that I needed to make. And from there, if I start here, this would be 0.11 then this would be point like one seven, that sort of thing. So as you're sort of mapping it, you're creating this data set, which is basically just two columns, or in this case, actually two columns, X and Y points, um, plus a point for who it is, because I'm, I'm also having to designate different shapes as I made my way down the page. So people, you'll see this uh, where people are sort of mapping lines onto a page that don't appear to be from a data source. You'll see this when people make uh, all sorts of exotic shapes. What they're doing there instead is doing a polygon, which if you do it with a line with a Cartesian coordinate like this, you get fancy lines like this. If you do it with the polygon thing on your Mark's card in Tableau, it'll attempt to connect to the beginning of your thing to the end of your thing and then fill it in. So if I did that here, this thing would look all weird and funky, um, which is why if you end up uh, trying to make stuff uh, with polygons, you have to make sure that you're beginning and end eventually reconnect, much like a connect the dots. I have a question um, and, and I don't know, maybe there's not a clear answer for this, but uh, what is the, the visualization that has taken you the longest? Wow, that's a great question. Um, it was, um, once a year, there is the Iron Viz competition, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know if everyone knows about that, but it's a big contest um, where they basically, sometimes they release a data set, sometimes they release a topic and hundreds of people enter. And then three people are selected to uh, compete on stage at the Tableau conference, making a Viz in 20 minutes. Um, so this past year, it was, it was a very broad topic and it was like health and wellness. So I took the idea of representation and because I'm a huge nerd, 
I looked at representation in comic books, particularly with black comic book characters. So uh, there was, uh, I forget which magazine it was, but they had a list of the top 10 all time uh, black comic book characters. And as I went through the list, I realized very few of them actually had black creators. Um, like Black Panther was created by, you know, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, who were both, you know, Jewish guys. Um, so as I went down the list, I started to notice many of the characters that were created by black comic book creators were from a company that most people have never heard of called Milestone, uh, which is now Milestone Media. It's, it was created by these four writers and artists who got together and said, hey, it'd be cool if we had a company that where we got to create characters that felt more authentic and looked more like people we knew. So there were people like Dennis Cohen, who's a famous author, and Dwayne McDuffie, who was a famous writer, who also went on later to have a really big career in animation. Dwayne McDuffie passed away in uh, 2011. But as I went down the page, I wanted to relate the idea of representation to the idea of the printing process and color. So when magazines and comics used to be printed back in the day, they would use CMY coloring which is you know, cyan, yellow, magenta. And by combining those three colors, you're able to create all sorts of other colors. But um, you aren't actually able to create like black, you're only able to create like really dark grays, which is why most printing processes use CMYK and K is key, which is black. So black is like the base for everything. So that's what sort of lays in the shadows and the depth and everything. And then you sort of fill in the rest of the color. So um, I worked my way through the idea of history of when these characters were represented, who made them, um, what the representation of the characters was in terms of sort of gender and stuff like that. And then went into the idea of expressing the story of Milestone and how so many of the characters on this page were created by this handful of people that no one had ever heard of, but sort of the authenticity of their creations has sort of gone on to outlive the uh, initial idea of the company. So anyway, I spent like 35 hours on it. It was a very, very long project. And it was almost as long as I talk right now. <laughs> Do you have any um, viz on your Tableau public page that you would consider your favorite? Wow, okay. Um, I kind of like, um, so I did one for the movie Tenant recently. And it's not the most complicated viz. In fact, a lot of it uh, was created in Tableau. The, the ba it's basically just a circle. Uh, and that's all I'll say if you haven't seen the movie. But uh, sort of, I was more proud that I actually understood that movie enough to explain it to anyone else. And then was actually able to come up with something visually that explained what was happening in the movie. Um, because it's a very, very confusing movie, even if you've seen it more than once with subtitles. But obviously, um, the topics I skew towards are more of the geeky end of the spectrum. But if you go out on Tableau Public, you will find someone that's into what you're into, whether it's sports or politics or, you know, faith or, or whatever. So, you know, get on out there. There's somebody that's into your stuff. I couldn't agree more. Does anybody else have questions for Zach? I don't see anything else coming up on the Q&A. Um, Zach, if you don't mind, do you want to drop your uh, Tableau public link in the chat box? Yeah, no problem. Let me go ahead and do that. Be awesome. If anybody else who's on wants to share their Tableau public link too, you know, it's always good to have other followers and be inspired by other people's work. Thank you so much. I cannot thank you enough for coming on today. And feel free to stick around and watch me go through some uh, tips and tricks for your uh, Tableau visits. Uh, full disclosure, um, Stephanie, my co-lead, was unable to be with us today. Um, and I attempted to put together a uh, tips and tricks uh, presentation that um, she had planned on giving uh, through this together on my lunch break today. So it is, it is um, definitely not up to the standard that I would typically prefer it be up to, but bear with me and um, hopefully you'll learn something you didn't already know. So um, let me just share my screen. All right, so if you have a table and 
you're interested in in shading the squares by a dimension instead of a measure. Um, this is something that that I like to do and for a long time couldn't figure out how to do it. Um, and there's probably more than one workaround, uh, more than one trick to doing this, but this is the one that I found and it works for me. So that's the one I'm gonna share with you today. So we have a table here. We have all the states on rows. We have several different years on columns. And then I have the year coloring right now, the text field. But if I wanna change this to a square, and then we have these little squares and then we have the values out next to them. And what I really want is for the square to really be a rectangle and take up the entire space of the cell. And I want the number centered in the middle of that square. So if I just go to my size box and I try to drag this all the way up to full size, it is not um, the way I want it to look. It is not confined to that single cell. It's actually bleeding over and overlapping with all of these other boxes. So that is not a way to do it. And yeah, you could probably drag this around and you might hit on that sweet spot to where it looks just about right. But if you're like me, you want it to be exactly right. So the best way I found to do this is to double click on your columns and it brings up a little pill where you can write a calculation. And you can put either single, quote, uh, single quotes or double quotes, either one will work. Just type them, no space or anything in between and hit enter and do the same thing on rows and hit enter. And that divides up your boxes for you and now your size can be altered and it will fill it exactly to the edges, the borders of that cell. And then from that point, you can go in here and you can align your text just the way you want. If you want to format it so that these additional lines and dividers are not showing, that's pretty easy to do too. Just come up here and we can just take out all of the axis and drop lines and reference lines and just set everything to none. But, oh, shift. that actually didn't get rid of any lines on the table. And that's because these are not lines, but they're actually borders. So you'll wanna come over here and just take your row dividers and your column dividers away. You can also, um, instead of pulling this down to the very bottom level, you can also go through and just change them all to none. Both of those are options. And then if you don't want these header dividers, you can take those out as well. And just have a nice blank page. Maybe not the best visualization practice, but if you wanna do it, that's how you do it. All right, so that was tip number one. Next up, we have tip number two, which is another coloration tip. This is how to color with separate legends. So we have our years on our rows, and then we have all of our different measure names up in the columns. Um, I'll mention that the, the data set I used to build this out is from a Makeover Monday in 2018. It's on, uh, on B Statistics. Um, and I can drop the link. Well, actually, I'm gonna just publish this out and make it public after this is over so you can download and work on it on your own. I wanted to have a springtime theme to go with Stephanie's uh, description of her, her tips and tricks. So that's why we went with honeybees. Anyway, back to the, the tip, how to color with separate legends. So we have our measure names here on columns. We have our measure values in the text box. If I were to hold down the control key and pull this up to color so that I don't lose my measure values, but it does add it to the color box. You'll see it colors the text and it's really hard to read. So if I go ahead and change that to a square so it's at least legible, um, you'll see that everything is colored by the minimum overall measure value 
and the maximum overall measure value, and those numbers are very far apart. 15 is very, very low, and 3 million is very, very high, and there's not a whole lot of differentiation. So if you want to have the beekeepers column only be shaded by the number of beekeepers, and then the colonies column only shaded by the number of colonies, et cetera, then you can go over to your measure values pill on color, click on the drop down, and tell it to use separate legends. You'll see automatically this goes through and shades everything by the different measures. So if you wanted to change one color to green and one color to yellow and one color to purple, well, first of all, don't really recommend doing that, but it is possible to do that. Usually you would come and click on your color and go to edit colors, but you'll see that that option is grayed out. So what you want to do is instead go to each individual measure and click on the edit colors option under your legend. So let's just go through and make everything a beautiful rainbow. Like I said, not the best practice, but to get our point across, we'll go ahead and change all these. All right, so now we have rainbow colors. So that's how you color with separate legends, tip number two. Moving on to tip number three, how to copy and paste your data. There are a few different ways to do this. There's more than one right way to do it. Um, first, you can go up to your worksheet and go to copy data. And you'll notice it has a control C next to it. That is the keyboard shortcut. So you can copy your data. Now, one place you can paste it is right back into Tableau. So you can just control V and paste your data into a clipboard. This is a really fast, helpful way if you have to um, get a certain level of detail on your data and you don't have Tableau prep. Um, this is something I used a lot more before I had Tableau prep. Um, you could just copy and paste it on the level of detail that you needed. So once you do copy and paste the data to your clipboard, I highly recommend going in and renaming it because otherwise you're not going to remember if you have multiple clipboards, what's what. So we're going to rename this. We're going to call this um, B colonies from Southern States. And now you have that. So going back, we have our copy and paste data. You can control C and open up an Excel sheet and you can control V and paste it right into your Excel. Now you'll notice that it does not keep the format that you had in your Tableau dash, uh, your dashboard, your desktop. Uh, you may have to insert a pivot table to get it back to that exact format that you want, but that's not too hard to do. In addition to copying from Tableau and pasting into Tableau in Excel, you can copy from Excel and paste directly into Tableau. So here we have a sheet with just some information on different types and sexes of worker bees, queen bees, drones. So I have this, I'm just going to highlight the worksheet and control C to copy it. Come back over into Tableau and control V to paste it. Just takes it a second and here we have our Excel as a new clipboard and we just want to right click on that and rename it E types. So there, that is a really fast way to bring in some information from Excel into Tableau without having to go through the whole connect to data. All right, so tip number four is about copying and pasting your formatting. And I do want to point out um, and I'll point it out again, that there are certain things that will carry over when you copy and paste formatting, and there are certain things that will not. 
So you'll notice in this, I have several things formatted. I have the title formatted, it's bold faced, and I have the worksheet formatted with a gray background. We have our heading formatted in red. We have our uh, labels formatted in a different font. And we have our color formatted on the bars. And then we have renamed our axis down here. So if you go up to format and you go to copy formatting, and then you go to another sheet that you want to apply that formatting to, this is the same sheet without formatting. And then you go back to format and paste your formatting. You'll notice that some of it changed, but not all. So your headers, the font and the color and the size all came across and your text labels, the font and the size color all came across. Your sizing didn't change. This is set to standard. It did not change to be a full screen. Your axis didn't change. Um, the one previously said total beekeepers. This did not change. Didn't change your title and it didn't change your color. So I'm gonna go here and show caption, which is another uh, nice trick. If you don't know how to show and hide your captions, I find it to be a very valuable way to get some information across in a viz. So here your caption is going to give you just a little hint as to what the formatting changes and what it does not. It changes your header text, your label text, your line formatting, your worksheet shading, but it does not change your axis, your worksheet title, your colors, or your page fill. Um, this is not an exhaustive list. There are other things that probably I'm missing from both lists, but that will at least give you some idea of what you can and can't change by copy and pasting your formatting. Next up, we have table calculations and how to compute using different, um, different parts and also how to do a custom label. So just to set the stage, we have our state, North Carolina. I went ahead and chose North Carolina because most of us are probably from here. Uh, we have our years and then we also have the total sum of colonies by year. Now, I went ahead and created a set using the state and North Carolina is the only state in this set. All right, so let's say I wanted to go in here and not necessarily see the total sum of colonies, but to see the difference from year to year. So we can actually do that with a quick table calculation. We'll come down here, we'll select difference, and that will show us, you know, it went down, then it went up and up and way down, and then back up and then down. All right, so what if we wanted to compare North Carolina and say our neighboring state of South Carolina? All right, so since we're using a table calculation and that is computing down the table, this number right here, this negative 6,072 is actually showing the difference from North Carolina in the 2016-17 year to South Carolina in the 2010-11 year. And that's not correct. So we need to go in here and change how we're calculating that. And we do that with compute using. We'll want to change it from table down to pane. That takes care of that. Now let's say we want to go in and format. Um, if you're like me, you use a lot of KPIs in your dashboards and maybe you don't want it to say negative 3,389. Maybe you wanna make it really clear to the end user by putting an arrow in place of that negative sign, an up arrow if it's positive, a down arrow if it's negative. And we can do that using custom formatting. So if you right click on your text pill and go to format, in here, make sure you're in pane, not axis, and then go to your numbers, down to custom, 
And if you're not familiar, there is a long, long, long list of different alt commands that you can use your keyboard to create different shapes. So if you type in alt 24, you get an up arrow. If you type in alt 25, you get a down arrow. There are lots of others, but those are the two we're gonna use in this particular example. So when you're putting in your custom formatting, it always goes in the same order. First positive, then negative, and then other. So if I want to show my positive with an up arrow, I will hold down the Alt key, type in 24. That gives me an up arrow. And then if I want to put the number, I put a number sign. If it is a number that is in the thousands and I want a comma, I'll put a comma followed by more number signs. So that would give me a thousand separator. If it were a decimal, then I could add a decimal and the number of decimal places that I want to be included. But these are not decimals. So once you have your formatted positive number, then you put a semicolon and next you will follow it with how you want your negative value formatted. So we'll do Alt 25 for a down arrow. And then we'll do our number with a comma for a thousand. No decimals again. And then if I were to have any zero values, I could include something specific for that value as well with putting another semicolon. And then I typically put just a double dash or something for a zero to show that it's flatlined. So that is how you go and put in special characters to format your numbers. So let's say I only want to show the most recent year. So let's say my 2016, 17, you can't put your year value in filters and deselect all of them because watch what happens if you do. The numbers blank, it has nothing to reference for the table calculation for difference. Instead of excluding those using a filter, you actually just need to select all of the years you don't want to show, right click and hide them. So now we have North and South Carolina for only the most recent year. We see that North Carolina went down 3,389 colonies and South Carolina went up 3,736 colonies. Next up, we have how to use a set to highlight a selection and also how to use it with showing and hiding a header. All right, so I mentioned before that I had already set up a set using the state values. So North Carolina is the only state in that set. So let's say I wanted to highlight North Carolina. Well, actually South Carolina is too now. So I wanna put my, my in out set in the color box. We have in and yellow, out and blue, but both of those states are way down this list and I'm scrolling and I still haven't found it yet. Scrolling, oh, there's one, okay. So we had to scroll a, a pretty long way to find it. What if we could just bring it to the top of the list? And we can do that using the set as well. So not only do I put the set in my color, I can put the set on my rows. Automatically, I've got any states that are in my set at the top, any states that are not in the set at the bottom. So that brings North and South Carolina to the top and it highlights them in yellow. If I want to change and say, look at Tennessee instead of South Carolina, it's as simple as checking it and unchecking it on your state set selector. So in my ultimate viz, I don't necessarily want to bring attention to the fact that these are in and out of a set. My end user doesn't necessarily need to see this extra column of data. 
And that's where the hide and show header comes in handy. So right now we're showing our header so we can check our work, but when it's time to publish, we can uncheck it and hide that. So what if we want to put all of our states that are in the set at the top and color them yellow, all of our states that are not in the set at the bottom and color them blue, but maybe we don't want this state header to be included. Um, maybe we want to be able to aggregate North, and, North Carolina and Tennessee together and then all the other states that are not in the set. And we can just take the state off of our rows in order to do this. So now we have all of our states in the set, North Carolina and Tennessee aggregated here, all other states aggregated here. So that's how you can use your set functions to highlight and to, to bring them to uh, the top or the bottom. You could change the, the sort order, however you need to do that to make it work for your viz. All right, so next we're gonna talk about two tips that you can use on a dashboard. So if you create any dashboards with floating objects, you may really want to, to tease that out and, and really get it lined up just, just so. And in order to do that, you can go to your dashboard and show the grid. And then that gives you this lovely layout that you can use to line up everything if you don't feel like going into your layout box and using pixels. So let's bring out table two as a floating object onto our dashboard. So let's say we want to line this up at the bottom in line with our, our legend. So our legend is actually down here this one's up a little too high. Let's just bring it down and line it up with these grid lines, square it just so, set the fit to the entire view and hide this title because it's just in the way. And we can also right click and hide this field label because it's kind of redundant. We can tell that this is a year selector and we can now click on a state in our viz. We can see some information about the year breakdown over here, and then we can see comparison in state out of, uh, sorry, in the set, out of the set to see how they compare. None of this is really meaning anything. And it, the idea wasn't to um, have a dashboard with this overarching message. This is actually, set up to show you how to, one, use grid lines, but two, how to hide sheets. So if you are familiar with right-clicking on your dashboard and hiding all the sheets that are included in that dashboard, just to clean up your tabs at the bottom. But what if you have a sheet that you don't use in your dashboard but you still want to hide from the tabs at the bottom. You don't necessarily want to delete the sheet. You may need it later. And that is what I'm going to show you how to do. So this, this sheet really not doing much for our dashboard. It's not visually appealing. It's not giving us any additional information, but maybe we're going to need it sometime in the future. So as long as your sheet is floating, you can actually float it right off the dashboard. So it won't show on your viz here. You can go to your layout screen, make sure you've selected that particular worksheet and then set the X and the Y position to negative. I always use 999. It doesn't have to necessarily be 999. You can tab over to your Y position and put negative 999, hit enter. All right, so now that sheet is on our dashboard, but it's not showing. And now when I right click and hide all sheets, it is also not showing on our tabs. So if you ever want to keep a sheet on your dashboard or in your workbook, but you don't want it to show here and you don't want it to show here, then you can just 
make it floating, move it off to the side, and it's there if you ever need it in the future. All right, so I'm going to publish these 10 tips that you can use in your Tableau Vizs um, on Tableau Public and make the, the link available to you all. But in the meantime, up until then, if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. And I'm going to stop sharing. And go back. I don't see any questions. I am going to put a link to our High Country Tableau user group survey in the chat box. If you filled it out in the past, you may want to fill it out again because you never know your information may have changed. Um, it's a really short survey just asking about what you would like to see in the Tableau user group in the future and what days are good for you to meet and what times. Um, so feel free to click on that link, fill it out, really short promise. Um, I believe our next meeting should be in July. Uh, so that will give us a few months. If you have any ideas, if you'd like to present, just let us know, okay? Thanks everyone for coming today. Thank you, Zach, for being our guest speaker. And I hope to see you all in a few months.